Why are stars and planets round? Why are all major celestial bodies spherical in shape? Is it possible to find big celestial bodies that are not spherical? As long as they are small enough, celestial objects can take on odd and irregular shapes. However, there is a mass limit above which every object tends to a spherical shape. Above this limit, the force of gravity overcomes the cohesive force of the bigger surface structures and any major prominence is drawn with enough force toward the center of gravity to destroy it. As the mass increases, so does the surface force of gravity and the shape of the celestial body becomes increasingly spherical. Of course, because the sphere is a geometric abstraction, there will always be minor differences. But is that all there is to it? Let's figure it out together. What is the total number of planets in the universe? A lot, it is expected to be around one sextillion. A number so huge, maybe billion trillion, that it is impossible to visualize in your mind. To give you an idea, the planet Earth weighs approximately an octillion times more than a walnut. However, all of this infinite is made up of objects that have one feature, they are all spherical. There isn't even a single cuboid, dodecahedral, or heart-shaped one. But why is this so? First and foremost, it should be remembered that we are discussing planets, not celestial objects. The term celestial bodies refers to a wide range of objects with distinct properties and shapes that, for various reasons, can differ significantly from the spherical one. Consider our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which has a disc-shaped structure rich in gas and stars amid a so-called halo of stars spread in a more or less spherical form. However, if we use the term celestial body to refer to particular objects such as stars or planets, it is true to remark that the typical shape is roughly spherical. The explanation for this is likewise pretty obvious. All of the most massive planetary objects, whether stars or planets, are generated by gravitational force, which is the force that attracts matter elements to each other and ultimately to the center of the expanding body. And if a large number of particles are drawn to a single site of aggregation, the result can only be a spherical agglomeration. And the greater the mass being constructed and the lower its density, the more like the end outcome will be to that of a perfect sphere. The physical principle at work is identical to that which causes soap bubbles to be spherical or fat bubbles and broth to be circular. Nature always chooses the shape that uses the least amount of energy. In fact, the spherical has the smallest surface area for the same volume. As a result, the soap bubble tends to take on a precisely spherical shape. In fact, it attempts to organize itself into the shape that requires the least amount of energy to sustain itself. Leaving soap bubbles aside, we may claim that very strong gravity prevents any surface roughness from exceeding a particular height. Mountains greater than around 10 kilometers, for example, cannot exist on Earth because they would gradually collapse in on themselves to a lesser size. With its bulk, the Earth could never have a rougher form than it has, except for the short time required to level out the irregularity. It is estimated that the highest surface roughness on neutron stars, stars whose very high mass and density make the surface gravity a hundred billion times stronger than what we experience on Earth, cannot exceed half a centimeter in height. Relating the dimensions to the Earth's scale, it would be as if there could be no mountains on our planet higher than five meters. The level that keeps an object with the physical parameters to be labeled a planet almost precisely spherical is known as hydrostatic equilibrium. A state in which the gravitational pull that drags matter toward the center is compensated by the push caused by material compression. The principle of hydrostatic equilibrium also allows us to determine whether a celestial object is a planet, a dwarf planet, or a small object like an asteroid, comet, etc. In fact, according to the International Astronomical Union's revised criteria for our solar system, planets and dwarf planets must have a spherical shape and have reached hydrostatic equilibrium in order to be designated as such. But how huge must an object be to reach hydrostatic equilibrium? 
It is determined by its composition, specifically the density of its upper layers. The truth is that gravity is a fairly weak force. Before an object can exert a strong enough gravitational force to overcome the resistance of the material it is comprised of, it must be extremely large. This, incidentally, is why you don't have to worry about your bodies collapsing into a spherical shape at any time. Anyway, let's try to make some sense of it. Although many aspects are involved in establishing the shape of an object, there are only three sorts that frame the problem. Objects with a diameter of roughly 400 kilometers, if such an item has a snowball density, or one gram per cubic centimeter, it will be able to acquire a spherical shape. Mimas, for example, is Saturn's seventh satellite and the 21st largest in the solar system, with a diameter of 396 kilometers. Because of its extremely low density, 1.15 grams per cubic centimeter, it is the smallest celestial body known to have a spherical shape. This example highlights a crucial distinction, the discrepancy between being spherical and being in hydrostatic equilibrium. The impact that formed the massive crater that resembles the Black Death left a scar that Mimas gravity cannot erase. Sphericity alone is not enough to qualify you as a planet, you must also achieve hydrostatic equilibrium. Objects of the same size and density will have more or less irregular forms. For example, Pallas and Vesta, two huge asteroids in the main belt that, despite having diameters higher than 500 kilometers, have a form that is far from spherical due to their extremely high density. Objects with dimensions around 1,000 kilometers this size often ensures a spherical shape but does not maintain hydrostatic equilibrium. If the object is dense and subjected to a significant deformation event, such as an impact, gravity will most likely fail to close the wound, and the object's overall shape will suffer. Surprisingly, the largest body known to be out of hydrostatic balance is Saturn's strange moon Jupiter, which has a diameter of up to 1,470 kilometers. Despite its low density, which should make achieving a spherical shape easier, its silhouette is defaced near the equator by an unbroken mountain range. It is unbroken and incredibly mysterious because its origin is unknown. However, do you know what the smallest spherical object in the solar system is that is in hydrostatic equilibrium? Ceres, the dwarf planet, has a diameter of 940 kilometers and is the largest asteroid. Orcus, 916 kilometers, Salacia, 846 kilometers, Quaor, 1,120 kilometers, Gong Gong, 1,230 kilometers, and Sedna, 995 kilometers, appear to be other spherical objects of this size in the hydrostatic equilibrium. Objects with a diameter of about 1,500 kilometers except for Jupiter, all objects approaching or exceeding this size turn out to be perfectly spherical and balanced. All of Jupiter's and Saturn's huge moons, as well as Uranus, Titania, and Oberon, Neptune's moon Triton, Pluto, and Eris, and, of course, our own moon. In brief, including the Sun, there are approximately 30 spherical objects that also meet the balance criteria. Then there are, literally, millions of small bodies with extraordinary shapes, lumps of boulders assembled in the most rambling of ways, such as Comet of gerasimenko visited in 2015 by the Rosetta probe, or the small asteroid Itakawa, visited in 2005 by the Japanese probe Hayabusa. Not to mention the things whose shape defies description. And I recall the menacing silhouette of the interstellar visitor Umiwamua, capable of sparking numerous speculations about its origin as it passed through our solar system. Or the strange flying saucer shape of Pan, Saturn's small moon hidden among its rings. So it's all clear now. In practice, gravity has all the advantages and disadvantages. However, gravity is not everything. While gravity works to make planets spherical, the speed of their rotations works to flatten them. The greater the speed with which a celestial body rotates, the more disproportionate its equatorial bulge gets. This is why our solar system has no perfect spheres, only oblate spheroids. 
Jupiter would be perfectly spherical if it did not rotate, but unfortunately, it rotates on itself in around 10 hours, making its equatorial diameter 10% bigger than its polar diameter. Similarly, Saturn, although Venus, which revolves around its axis relatively slowly in 243 days, is the most spherical planet of all. Even the Sun can be regarded a perfect sphere due to its massive gravity and relatively moderate rotation speed of 25 days, yet a substantial percentage of stars in the sky rotate much quicker and bulge significantly at the equator. Akerner, the ninth brightest star in our sky, is an example. Its rotation time is two days, compared to around 27 for our Sun. To make matters worse, the star is far larger and more massive, with an equatorial velocity of at least 250 kilometers per second, or 125 times the sun's. Faster than that, and the star would disintegrate. This tremendous speed produces a strong centrifugal effect, flattening the star and making its equatorial diameter 11 times that of the sun, 56% greater than the pole. However, it is in good company in terms of flattened stars, unusual revolving stars abound, including Regulus, Altair, and the well-known Vega. Red supergiants like Betelgeuse and other massive stars have generally spherical shapes, but with significant surface modifications caused by the convective rise of hot gas, which creates large, irregularly shaped bubbles on their surfaces. Finally, I'd want to bring up galaxies once again. They too have a wide range of shapes due to their rotation. If their global rotational motion were zero, they would take the shape of globes, just like spheroidal elliptical galaxies and globular clusters. In short, there are no dull moments in space. Don't you think so? Alright everyone, here's where the video ends. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.